Saturdays filled with fun. Seminole fans across the state look to the sun. To the coaches and players, we all say thanks. Now enjoy the highlights brought to you by Sunbank. Fans everywhere. Expected to go nowhere, this Florida State team produced the nation's leading scorer, finished in the top ten teams in America, and won a major bowl game. With a perfect blend of youth and experience, the Seminoles shocked three national powerhouses and established themselves as a member of major college football's elite in 1982. They would do it with character, coming from behind to win three major games, two of them on the road. In this new season, the Seminoles truly became a team. A Florida State football 1982 was a year of surprise. Didn't have a quarterback, didn't have a punter, a kicker came back injured. Uh, defense had been killed a year before, and uh, only two re uh, returners on the offensive line. So we did not, really did not think we'd be, be very competitive. We felt like it was a team maybe that we could learn going into the year and maybe, maybe could get better by the end of the year. So we really thought we were going to take a lot of leggings this year. And because of that, we decided to go ahead and play a lot of young players. If we're going to, you know, go ahead and put some young ones in there and let's just go with them and build for 1983. This rags to riches story began in early September at home against Cincinnati. All of head coach Bowden's fears of this season appeared to be coming true. Cincinnati jumped to a 14-0 lead after two Florida State turnovers. Blair Williams was starting his first varsity game, and he looked to number 44, Ricky Williams, to get the offense started. This 20-yard touchdown seemed to spark the Seminoles as they proceeded to score 21 unanswered points. 14 by sophomore Greg Allen. Blair Williams and Tony Johnson put on a show. Over 50,000 watched as Cincinnati came back to within seven late in the fourth quarter. And Bobby Bowden wasn't the only one worried about the situation. In desperation, trailing by seven, Cincinnati tried a Hail Mary. The defense held, and the Seminoles won their opener 38 to 31. This team got behind and came back and won the football game in a high-scoring affair. I think that gave us an indication it might be a little quality or character down there out of somebody or, or, or a bunch of somebody that, that was going to help us, help us do some good things that year. A major test for this young team lay ahead in the next game when number one ranked Pitt came to Tallahassee. The weather was a perfect barometer for the Seminoles' fortunes this day. Blair Williams looked sharp as he hit Jesse Hester twice. The drive continued, and Greg Allen took it in from the three. Phil Hall added a field goal, and Florida State was outscoring the number one team in America 10 to nothing. Pitt showed why they were number one by scoring 17 straight points. The Seminoles tied it at the half 17 all when Ricky Williams got in from the one. The sky changed to darkness and to rain, and the Seminoles' dream of a major upset was washed away in an ugly storm. Pitt won it. 37 to 17. Misfortune usually brings with it either more hard times or the will to rise above it. Coming up to the dark side of the toughest NCAA football schedule in 82, 
it was sink or swim for Florida State. The Seminoles visited Hattiesburg, Mississippi the next week to fight another cliffhanger against Southern Mississippi. Bobby Bowden knew he was going to have to score every way possible if he was going to avenge last year's 45-point loss to the Eagles. So unpredictable were the Seminoles against Southern Mississippi that many still believe this game was won on guile. Kelly Lowry was the new starting quarterback, and it was his first starting assignment as play caller. Ricky Williams banged his way to the 26th. A few plays later, Ken Burnett took it in, and Lowry was executing well under pressure. The defense got the ball back again, and Lowry began the most important drive of the night. He picked up big chunks of yardage on each pass. He got down to the two, and on fourth down, tied at 17 in the last quarter, with the coolness of a riverboat gambler, Lowry faked the field goal and carried it in for the victory. It was a patented Bowden win, 24-17, and the Seminoles were two and one. Back at the athletic dorm, training table was the perfect environment for the chemistry of this young team to come together. Florida State took their show on the road again the following week, this time to the north, to play Big Ten giant Ohio State. Buckeye fans were licking their lips, waiting to get even with the Seminoles for last year's upset win over Ohio State. Two 18-year-old freshmen, a year out of high school, started this historic game for the Seminoles. What would you feel about going into Ohio State? You know, they got got big stadium, 80,000 people. It's, Everybody's cheering, you can't hear a word out there. How'd you feel when you went down there? Wasn't that exciting? I thought it was kind of terrifying because, you know, you looked up into the stands and all you saw was a sea of red. 80,000 80, people just looking down at you, booing at you. <laughs> it was wild. The question was, would they collapse? That was a pivotal game for us. We uh, just came off the big game at uh, Southern Mississippi and, and we you know, people were saying, hey, look at Florida State, you know, maybe they're going to do something this year. And, and we worked hard that week, harder than maybe any game, you know, for the year. Um, and going up there, we just had a good attitude because we had beaten them the year before, and, and, but no one really knew. The suspense didn't last long. A well-conceived game plan took the home team by surprise. The Seminoles showed Ohio State some tricks and then set them up for a gadget play as old as the game of football. Kelly Lowry pitched back and drifted toward the goal line. It was a perfect halfback pass to the quarterback that shocked the Buckeyes. The play is called 46 throw back to the quarterback and uh, we've got our designated thrower, Cedric Jones, who comes in and, and uh, can throw the ball really well from the tailback position, and uh, it was a toss, fake toss. I gave him, the, uh, I pitched the ball to him, and I, I just kind of rolled out nonchalantly, trying to uh, let the ends chase him, and they did. And he threw the ball up to me, and I caught it, and, uh, and got hit right at the goal line and scored. A few plays later, another Bowden classic. Lowry looks right, throws left, and there's wide open Zeke Moa. Once again, the defense and Larry Harris gave the offense the ball. This was the best defensive performance by the Seminoles thus far. Lowry executed the perfect option play to Greg Allen, and Florida State goes up 21-17 at the half. It was here that the defense took control of the game. Tommy Young intercepts.
Dave Ponder drops the Buckeye runner for no gain. John McLean takes his man down. And Tommy Young intercepts again. The Seminole defense turns nasty, shutting out the Buckeyes the entire second half. Number 76, Alfonso Carrick, came to FSU from Columbus, Ohio. He got a chance to show his hometown what they were missing. The next hit by number 13, Kim Mack, on the kickoff, would take whatever life was left in the Buckeyes away. The stage was set for Blair Williams to apply the crushing blow. I went in, and Jesse just broke a fade to the corner, and uh, all I had to do was lay it over. And he caught it. He's done real well, too, this year. And uh, we're all proud of him. And that pretty much got that game uh, out of the hole. Ricky Williams had Buckeye fever, and FSU won it 34-17. The Seminole squaws welcome their team back to Tallahassee, where they would meet Southern Illinois. Aware of FSU's stunning defeat of their northern neighbor, Ohio State, Southern Illinois would have been wiser to have stayed home. This eight touchdown offensive explosion was simply too much for the visitors to handle. The Seminoles scored four touchdowns in the second quarter and four more in the second half to blow out Southern Illinois 59 to eight. The defense was intimidating again, causing several turnovers. So diverse was the Seminole offense that after only the fifth game, 11 different players had run the ball and 15 different players had caught a pass. The following week, East Carolina came to town sporting the 16th best defense in America. They left 56-17 losers. It was another four touchdown day for Greg Allen and it moved Greg closer to the national scoring title. I try not to let the pressure bother me, uh, but every time you go into a game, there's some kind of nervousness you have. I've learned to uh, not let the pressure get to me, just go out there and play what I practice. I think a running back gets the most uh, publicity. Uh, everybody's watching the runner more you know, than playing on defense. I like that publicity, and I like to uh, be the person that uh, gets the action. Greg Allen won the NCAA scoring title in 1982 with 21 touchdowns. Only a sophomore, he's the best in the nation. Florida State was 5-1 and one and headed for their biggest game of the season thus far against intrastate rival Miami. For FSU players, this game was a matter of pride. Miami had won the last two games between them. The Hurricanes had run all over Mississippi State the game before, and the paper said they planned to do it again against the Seminoles. Nose guard Dave Ponder thought otherwise. I'm speaking for the rest of the defensive players, and we're going to stop you, Miami. We're going to stop you running game cold. Idle words, they were not, as the visitors from upstate shut down both the Miami running and passing game. The Florida State defense was for real. The regionally televised game had a carnival atmosphere, a strange backdrop that would have little effect on the highly emotional tribe who had been waiting for this game. Lowry hits Orson Mobley for good yardage. A deft fake gives Tony Smith some running room behind superb blocking. 
and he gets into Miami territory. Bill Hall kicked a 36-yard field goal to take a 3-0 lead. The defense was intimidating Miami into mistakes, and the Seminole offense took advantage. This time, Lowry to Hester for 25 yards and Greg Allen goes in from three yards out. The Seminoles lead just before the half, 10 to nothing. And what must have been the turning point in the game came on a spectacular defensive play by Tommy Young. On fourth down and Miami one yard away from the end zone, Young starts from five yards deep and meets Miami's Mark Rush head on. Rush fell backwards and Florida State went into halftime with a 10-0 lead. Another angle shows Young's penetration and the help he gets from Ken Rowe. It was all Florida State, the defense's finest hour. Ken Rowe finished the day with 24 tackles, more than any FSU player in any other game in 1982. The Seminoles held the heralded Miami running attack to 91 yards and moved the spotlight over to the offense. Lowry hits Hassan Jones on a 20-yard slant in, and the fourth down play that turned out the lights was described by Kelly Lowry. We, we had a screen pass called, and uh, Miami came up with a defense that we didn't really like, and we called timeout and went to the sidelines, and, and we knew that they were looking screen, looking for the screen, so we called a play, which is called Gator Pass. We put it in for University of Florida the year before, and uh, what it was is I dropped back to pass, and I turned and faked, faked the screen, which makes the linebackers move out, and Mobley comes underneath the linebackers, and they were in man coverage, and they, they just totally neglected him. I hit him with a ball, and it was a short pass, and he just rambled on in and, and carried three men into the end zone with him. That touchdown made it 17-7 FSU. These young men bubbled with the happiness of little boys. And minutes later, Greg Allen carried it in for the final score. Florida State won it in Miami. 24 to 7, and the character of the Seminoles was becoming clearer each week. Bobby Bowden's young players were 6 and 1, and had knocked off two national powers. No one thought we were going to do well, and, and that was that was the thing that probably made us play harder. Was to uh, you know we didn't have any respect, and uh, well, I think we gained some through the year. The Seminoles had indeed won new respect. They were becoming known as the rudest guests in major college football. The next week, they were invited to play in Columbia, South Carolina, an invitation the Gamecocks would regret. Kelly Lowry starts the offense rolling as he hits Tony Johnson for a 20-yard gain. Lowry then finds Johnson again, who demonstrates a few moves and scores, and FSU is off and running. Leading scorer Greg Allen got over three times from inside the 10. The shutout crowd was turned sour as Lowry hit Ouija Thompson on a 48-yarder to make it 35 to 12. The defense did the rest as Warren Hanna blocked a punt and recovered it in the end zone.
the defense continued to dominate the Gamecocks, intercepting three passes, giving them 22 thus far this season. The Seminoles put it away 56 to 26 and came home seven and one and on fire. The nation's leading scorer, Greg Allen, added four more touchdowns against Louisville. And FSU devastated Louisville 49 to 14. They traveled to Baton Rouge, Louisiana the next week to battle for the right to play in the Orange Bowl. The Seminoles were ranked seventh in the nation, a far cry from the critics' preseason predictions. Florida State and LSU were both eight and one. Bobby Bowden rolled up his sleeves to go to work again against another top 10 team on the road. Lowry came out throwing, and Tony Smith got deep into Tiger territory. A few plays later, Lowry keeps around left end for a touchdown. And the LSU Tiger told the story. Lowry passed to Orson Mobley down to the 25. Then Lowry threw a swing pass to Tony Smith who turned it into a 34-yard touchdown play. It was 14-14 when it all fell apart. LSU went on to score five unanswered touchdowns and win it 55-21. Florida State was offered a bid to play in the Gator Bowl December 30th. A 13-10 loss to Florida did little to dampen the excitement of the Seminoles' first meeting ever with the West Virginia Mountaineers in the Gator Bowl. Bobby Bowden had been the head coach at West Virginia, and the Mountaineers were favored to best the Seminoles in Florida State's own backyard. I knew it was my last game at Florida State, and I wanted to go out uh a winner, and I think that the, the team needed to win and really to help things for next year and get things started right here at the Gator Bowl. The rain that had brought ill fortune earlier to FSU would befriend them this day. West Virginia went for the early knockout, picking up large chunks of ground on each down. Plays like this blocked field goal by Alfonso Carica kept Florida State in the game. After all the yardage gained by West Virginia in the first 25 minutes of play, they had only three points. The crusher came on the kickoff after a Mountaineer field goal. Billy Allen took it on the four and flew 96 yards to put the Seminoles up 10 to three. West Virginia, the whole first quarter and a half, dominates the game, but only gets three points out of it. Now, we've had three shots at it. We haven't done anything, but we did get three. All of a sudden, Billy Allen runs 95 yards for a touchdown. We had uh, seven points. We ain't had the ball. FSU went to the shotgun formation to slow the fierce West Virginia pass rush. And just before the half, Williams hits Dennis McKinnon for a TD. And it's FSU 17. West Virginia six at the half. Bobby Bowden had built a team from scratch that became the only Florida school to appear in a major bowl in 1982. West Virginia came out storming again in the second half. FSU punted, and Brian Harlow made a touchdown saving tackle, which proved critically important as the Mountaineers threatened to make it close. The defense forced a fourth down situation and sacked the Mountaineer quarterback to kill the drive. An unexpected reverse. D 
deep in their own end pays off as Dennis McKinnon romps 65 yards. Greg Allen then followed a key block by Burnett, and with this score, West Virginia seemed to go flat. It was FSU 24, West Virginia 6. The defense never let up. Brian McCrary intercepted a pass and brought it back 20 yards. Virginia changed quarterback, and he gets dumped by Carrick. John McLean levels a receiver. The hard-working Seminole coaches help this 82 team accomplish a ranking in the coveted top 10, as surprising Florida State went on to win it 31 to 12. Greg Allen was named Gator Bowl MVP and a team that was picked to go nowhere had just won the 1982 Gator Bowl. It's a good way to finish your season, and to win a bowl is something that uh, you always want to do throughout your college career, and we had the chance to do it, and I'm just proud of all the guys on the team. And they pulled through, and we did it. Beat a good team. I believe we accomplished more than what anybody else thought we was going to do. They, everybody at the sports bar thought we would go six and five, the bowl gave us an opportunity to make the big jump up into the top ten in the nation. And, uh, and, and, and coming off of a two-game losing streak now, uh, we, you know, we felt like those bowls took a gamble on us, taking us with a two-game losing streak. And yet we come back and win big, and then we get voted into the top ten in the nation. I thought I just uh, our assistant coaches and our players, uh, boy, they deserve a lot of credit for that. What began as a season out of focus? had blossomed into an exciting dream for 1983. For head coach Bobby Bowden, the FSU team, and the thousands of loyal Seminole fans, 1982 was indeed a year of surprise. If you enjoyed this 1982 Florida State highlight film, you ought to thank Sunbank. On behalf of the Florida State coaching staff and football team, we want to thank Sunbank for the support uh, and production of this 1982 Florida State highlight film. <laughs>